everybody and welcome to our event today um, on Introduction to Angel Investing. It's a great pleasure to have you join us today. As always at Launch Vic, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many lands upon which we're meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. We've got a large number of people joining us today. I think we've got over 150 registrations and we've got a really fabulous panel lined up to explore the ins and outs of angel investing. We actually started this series last year and that feels like such a long time ago um, in the Good Shed. Um, and it was really to help us address a critical issue in Victoria's startup ecosystem. And that is the lack of access of seed capital, which is typically provided by angel investors. In 2019, the average funding that um, early stage startups received in Melbourne across all startups, so those who were funded and those who weren't funded, was 156,000 US dollars on average. That compares to New Zealand at 278,000 on average, and the US in Boston, for example, 582,000 on average. And what that says is not enough startups are getting funded. And when those startups are getting funded, we know they're not necessarily re receiving large enough angel investments to help them with the runway. We see the same pattern reflected on angel investors. Um, in 2017, 2018, the latest data on the amount of angel investors per capita. In Australia, it was just $3.60 on average per capita was invested by individuals into startups. That compares to $5 in New Zealand and over $12 in um, the United Kingdom. So we know we've got a problem, but we also know that angel investors are just so important to our ecosystem. A report commissioned for Launch Vic by Professor Josh Lerner of Harvard University showed that um, startups that receive angel support are 70% more likely to then go on and receive venture capital, they're 20% more, more likely to hire employees, and they're 10% more likely to have a successful exit. All this data is obviously collected from before the pandemic, and we know now more than ever it's going to be important to help us drive our angel investor community in what's going to be, by the looks of it, a really challenging environment. And COVID pandemic has definitely exacerbated some of the challenges we know that exist on access to capital. To help us deep dive into this topic, we have assembled a, a panel of three amazing and extremely competent angel investors. We're absolutely delighted to have Carol Schwartz, Chris Gray and Kaylee, Kylie Fraser joining us today for this discussion. And I'm sure we're going to have a, a, a really great discussion. And I'm going to give them a mo a, a, an opportunity to introduce themselves in a moment. But before I start, I want to touch on a few items of housekeeping. First of all, we are recording this session today. Secondly, we have a Q&A channel as well as a chat channel. Please use the chat channel to find out and chat with colleagues and, and other attendees, but also it's an opportunity to get information and the LaunchVic team's on hand to share, for example, websites, etc., as they get uh, raised through this discussion. For all questions, please send them through the Q&A channel and I'll be moderating that channel and we will do our very best to answer all of your questions. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's get started. And I wanted to begin by giving you an opportunity to introduce yourselves um, to the teams, not only um, as uh, angel investors, but more broadly. I think one of the things that I always find incredibly interesting in talking to investors, and particularly startup investors, is the journey that led you here. Um, and how did you become an angel investor? So Carol, can we begin with you? What led you on this journey of angel investing? Well, Hi, Kylie, and, uh, Kylie, Chris, and Kate. And thank you very much, Kate, for inviting me to join the panel today. I was very excited to become part of this discussion. And uh, it's so nice to hear in, um, in your housekeeping that we don't have to talk about emergency exits, because, of course, we're all in our own venue. So it was quite a different sort of housekeeping, wasn't it? <laughs> um, well, my background is... Um, I guess in a way, my move into angel investing was sort of a just a progression of the way my business life started because I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family and uh, in fact, I started my own business after having been a, uh, a very young lawyer for about five minutes. I started my own business, which was a, um, 
a, an aerobics and dance studio at the age of 23, which I funded myself uh, with my husband. And, um, and so my journey to entrepreneurship and, and investing started then with my own experience, I guess. And um, so to start investing in other people's businesses was actually just a natural progression. And for me, when I met someone who had what I considered to be a great idea, but I guess most importantly, a great person, um, I would be prepared to back them. Fantastic. And we know that um, entrepreneurship is definitely something that is, um, there's a, a, a genetics to it to a point where we know that um, families that are entrepreneurial breed entrepreneurialism, but we also know that it's a muscle and we, we really, I'd love to explore how we can get more entrepreneurship happening because it's, uh, it, it's certainly something that we know that people that are brought up in entrepreneurial environments tend to be entrepreneurial. Um, well, and I, if I can just say to, to that, I think it's because uh, people who are brought up in an entrepreneurial environment um, have an attitude to risk um, that potentially those who aren't brought up in that entrepreneurial environment don't have. So I guess, you know, when you see uh, the risks that you take when you're setting up your own business, the money that you're spending, the fact that you're not earning a salary, that no one else is there to pay your wage, that you actually have to earn it yourself, plus pay the wages of others, you know, that can be quite scary for others. If you're brought up in that sort of environment, that sort of fear factor, I think, doesn't exist to the same extent. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right there, Carol. And um, talking of people taking the plunge into starting their own business, Chris, you set up your own business. Um, I know the story, but perhaps you could share with uh, others what led you into um, angel investing and the, and the story of I Care Health. Yeah, th thanks, thanks, Kate. And and, and even prior to uh, starting our own business, I was part of a management buyout of uh, Dun and Bread Street. So, um, as part of a leadership team, and that was my first exposure to, um, you know, creating value for for the work that that you were doing as an entrepreneur. That 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 um, we were able to acquire the assets of uh, Dun and Bread Street in Australia and New Zealand. And we were able to grow that business up and successfully exit it. From that point, I started my, my own business and Eye Care Health, which was focused on clinical care and um, medication management for the aged care industry. And that, that again, was um, something taken from zero to something we took overseas. And not only that then created value on an economic, but that's what really triggered me into how, um, how you could drive change and how you could drive change through business for particularly around social outcomes. And uh, um, my, my journey into um, early stage investing was all around how, you know, living through that experience of being able to get that blended value of social impact and economic value, how then could you get behind, once we exited that business, both here and in the UK, how, do we, how could we do more to get behind entrepreneurs who are looking for business to drive that change. So that's how I got into angel investing as to how, how I could contribute back after, after we had been, um, been involved in businesses ourselves. Mm. And Chris, before I move on to Kylie, do you think there's enough support for people to make that transition from having their own business to becoming um, an, a, 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 an investor? Um, if you were in the liquidity markets, for instance, there'd be all manner of stockbrokers and, and supports out there. Do we have enough supports, in your view, in helping people make that transition? Or is it something that you had to go on your own journey to find? Uh, I, I think there's more now. I think, Kate, that, that the answer to is, you know, the ecosystem that, that's starting to come about. But um, I certainly went on my own journey and now, now it's sort of, you know, the more you look, the more other things appeared and maybe they were already there, but I can see a lot more things happening, even discussions like the one we're having here, that wasn't available, you know, five, 10 years ago. And so that, that opportunity to be, uh, to have these types of discussions um, starts to say, well, what is the progression for somebody who's exited their businesses? And they want to get involved because they want to not only share, um, not only, not only invest, but but also share what they've learned. You can't take it with you. So what you've learned and what you've seen with others, how do you share that with, with other entrepreneurs to help them not only from um, um, financial capital, but intellectual capital as well. So the more of that uh, pathway is being created to make it easier. 
and we're definitely hoping to tap into some of your learnings today. <laughs> so Kylie, um, you had a very different journey. Um, like Carol, you were a lawyer, but perhaps you could uh, talk a little bit about where, uh, how you got into angel investing. Sure. Um, so after after a very a much longer tenure as a lawyer than, than Carol, I didn't have the sense to get out as quickly as she did. Um, I started an innovation lab for professional service firms when I was on maternity leave with my first child, and it was an epic failure. Um, taught me a lot about failing quickly and the importance of building product rather than selling services. Um, but I, you know, I, I loved the process of, of building something from scratch. So had another crack at the at the founder game with a telemedicine business um, that was um, luckily um, more successful. Um, I joined a bunch of angel groups thinking that I would learn, you know, how to raise a round by masquerading as an angel investor. Um, because of my background as a lawyer, I still had my rich person certificate that allowed me to get started. Um, and I quickly realised how much more fun um, and, dare I say, easier it is to invest than to actually do it yourself. I loved the people that I met investing. I loved being able to look at so many different things. Um, and I've been on this side of the table ever since. Although since starting Eleanor Venture, I now seem to be straddling both sides and I'm, I'm the founder again. But I, I, did, I didn't quite think that thought. I still, that is my dog. Um, <laughs> quite all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's good to, to kind of ha have a foot back in both camps a little bit more now. Yeah. And, and Kylie, you touched on angel groups and, and I'm going to throw back to Carol because Carol, you, you've been absolutely instrumental in um, setting up scale angels in, um, scale investors in, in, in Victoria. And that was really well before its time. It was well before there was a really established ecosystem. Um, but scale has obviously played a really seminal role in our community here. Um, what led you to set up scale? And um, if you could talk a little bit about uh, the role of angel groups and, and when do you invest through a group versus when do you invest individual? Yeah, so interesting. I mean, when we have these sorts of discussions, I realise I've been around a really long time because I was around at the time of the dot-com boom of the late 90s, right? And, um, and I think that that was the genesis of VC investing, angel investing, and an awareness in, in Australia. And um, at that time, the sort of the creativity that was that that came out of that was incredible. So you had, you know, lawyers leaving law firms and becoming entrepreneurs. You had bankers leaving banks and becoming entrepreneurs. I mean, you know, and I remember, you know, D Store, for example, and um, Wishlist, which were the, you know, online e-commerce businesses when there was no online e-commerce enablement. So it was sort of like our imaginations really got ahead of us as to what was possible, what wasn't possible. But what it did was it, it, it created a, if you like, and I won't call it an ecosystem, but it, it, it did create a, a sort of a gathering around of like-minded people who, who got very excited by this creativity, innovation and entrepreneurship and were prepared to invest in it. And um, one of the things actually, when Chris was speaking about, about impact and investing, angel investing, one of the first things that I ever invested in was a fabulous business, which um, I think was our first, as one of Australia's first impact investments, real for-profit impact investments, which was our community, which is a fantastic organisation run by Dennis Moriarty, um, which was actually created to build capacity in the not-for-profit sector and, um, and, and to create, if you like, um, an amazing resources for community organisations all of which were funded out of commercial relationships. So that was where the income was coming from, but the service was being provided to the not-for-profit sector. And uh, that has become, you know, an amazing success story. Now, still in private ownership, um, still with the, uh, our original investors. So when we invested in that, and I guess this is, you know, sort of very loose syndication, I, you know, when Dennis came to me with the idea and said, 
you know, this is the amount of funding that I need. I think he needed a million dollars at that time. I spoke to my brother. I spoke to a colleague who from Macquarie Bank. And I spoke to um, another uh, entrepreneur, uh, Justin Liberman. And I said, how about we all invest in this? And so we all invested in our community. We remain investors. And it was, was absolutely fabulous to watch it grow, to help it grow, to see the impact that it was having. Sorry, that was a long-winded way of getting to scale. But um, scale came out of a conversation that I had when I met Laura McKenzie for the first time. And um, she spoke to me uh, about the lack of funding for women entrepreneurs. Now, that was interesting for me because I had invested in a number of women entrepreneurs, which I was doing. I was, I'd never called it angel investing. I never called it part of being an ecosystem. I just called it great investment opportunities because people would come to me with ideas and I would say, yeah, I really like that. Um, that's great, let's, let's do it and, I, and I'd love to be part of it. So when Laura came to me and she said, look, um, this is the situation for women entrepreneurs um, and I'd like to do something about it. She then introduced me to Susan Oliver and Annette Kimmett and we got together and formulated Scale as a startup. And um, it was, I mean, I thought it was a fantastic concept from the very beginning. And uh, I had heard of Golden Seeds in the US and we based ourselves on Golden Seeds with, of course, an Aussie adaptation, as you always have to do. Because the interesting thing is that the profile of the women in the US who are doing this sort of investing is a whole lot different to the profile of the women here who do that sort of investing. But scale has, has uh, look, it's, it's had its upside, uh, ups and downs. It's had its challenges. Um, I think, um, again, with the, the profile of, of, of our membership, you know, we're not used to sort of um, paying large memberships and, and uh, being part of a, you know, a, a, a very sort of highly, um, highly commercial, if you like, or not highly commercial, but, you know, a very expensive operation. And uh, so it was all about educating women about how to invest in, in women entrepreneurs. But of course, Scale invests in organisations where men and women are both the entrepreneurs and the executive team, but we must have women who have skin in the game in Scale. And I think it's proven to be a great success. Absolutely. And, and Kylie, you've also got a real interest in, in female entrepreneurship and, and, and supporting female entrepreneurs. And uh, through Eleanor Ventures, you're sort of, I guess, taking um, the, the C to Series A angle and in, in terms of supporting those companies. Um, how do you find um, syndication versus individual investments? What, where do you see the balance being there? I think the, the best thing about syndication is that you can leverage your own investment dollars. If I've got $10,000 to invest by myself, it's hard to get access. You can't negotiate good terms and you, you can't ask for diligence. You know, you can't take up a whole lot of an investor's time if you've got a little check. Um, but if you join a syndicate and you put all those little checks together, then someone like me can go and do that work for you. Um, and you've you know, got the power and the, the leverage of, of that money behind you. And the, the key thing, you know, if there's one thing that, that people take away from, from you know, a, a webinar titled, you know, how to get started in, in angel investing, it's, it's diversification. Like none of us can pick the one winner. It's not about having one bet on, you know, on Uber. Um, you know, good luck if you can. Um, but you, you, have to, you have to write lots of small checks. Um, and for, for most angel investments, to directly access them yourself, Minimum checks, usually around 50K. Um, if you want to make 20 investments, which is kind of table stakes for wanting to build a diversified portfolio, I don't have, you know, I don't know what, you know, 50 times, you know, not many people have that amount of money. Whereas if you start in a syndicate at Eleanor, we take 5K checks at a time. It's much easier to build a diversified portfolio with a smaller amount. And in fact, 
Kylie, you've done a fantastic job of answering our first question, which was how can we invest in groups if we only have a low budget? <laughs> so uh, Ricardo, you need to contact Kylie. <laughs> and uh, other groups like um, Scale Angels and Impact Investment Group, which is another angel group that Launch Vic has been involved in, in, uh, in working with. And Chris, you are indeed an impact investor yourself. Um, and uh, are very involved in, in some of the work that's going on around Melbourne's impact investment um, theme. Um, I, I wanted to sort of move a little bit into investment thesis. And how did you go about developing your investment thesis? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the, just going back to initially what I was um, talking about was, I, I believe that entrepreneurs look at things differently. And when you want to see change, that one of the best ways to do that, and there's there's a long history of business being able to move move drive that change, and and so so my thinking was I obviously had some deeper knowledge in aged care, and one of the things that I certainly want to see is that as an example that um, I want to change I want to be able to change the way the elderly and vulnerable live in their own homes as we age as a nation, as we as we have people. Uh, living with by themselves in their own home, they can't go to an aged care facility. So you attack, we're leaving people in their homes, as an example, with complex healthcare issues, with dementia, that we never would have done in the past. That would have gone to an aged care facility, but they will be will be living. So technology plays a role. So how do we change that? Now I'm not going to be the one who actually is in there doing the change, but if 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 we look at entrepreneurs who um, you go and find who maybe are tackling dementia, maybe they're tackling a smart home, maybe they're tackling loneliness. Uh, as an issue, then, then if you get behind them and start to say, well, that, that sort of starts to make sense. So that that forms part of my thinking, and then and from there, I've broadened out um, around that impact, around certainly around health um, and the changes that can, that you can see that um, need to be driven in health, and how entrepreneurs can do that to things like the environment as well. And I don't understand as much about the science around the environment and that change but you can find the people that do. And if you're interested in that and you're interested in and helping that change, what can you do to help them if they're starting up a business to share your intellectual capital as well as, some, as, well as the financial capital to be able to coach them through um, looking at their business model because they're looking for that blended value again and they're looking for the social impact, but they're also looking for, got to make this business sustainable, but also, the more you can make that attractive, the more capital that will come into that industry. So, you know, if, 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 if um, the ageing and the change to the ageing um, drives an economic value as well as a social impact, capital will, be, um, will come to that industry. Absolutely. And just a reminder to everybody who's attending, please pop your questions in the Q&A channel. Um, there's some, some great questions coming through there. Um, Carol, I was going to ask, with all your experience in, in investing over many years, how important is it to be behind a particular sector or, or um, how much knowledge do you need to have in that sector or are you prepared to diversify across industries that perhaps you're not as familiar with? Mm, great question. None at all. <laughs> Most of the things I've invested in, I've had no knowledge of or experience of at all. But, you know, you have to have, uh, obviously, when you look at a business plan um, that's presented to you, you're going to have a, a SWOT analysis and you're going to get some sort of understanding of uh, what the competitive environment is like. And, you know, there are rules of thumb around that. But, you know, the most important thing is, is, is the entrepreneur. I mean, the entrepreneur might, you know, to Chris's point, the entrepreneur might start off with a particular idea. Um, around what a solution to a problem is. But then in working up that idea, they realise that they have to evolve that idea and pivot and, and, and reshape it in, in many varied ways. And so what you want to be investing in is um, an incredibly smart, flexible, uh, pivotable person who knows how to take advantage of an opportunity um, but is is able to move when that opportunity moves. So, I mean, in terms of industries, I mean, I even think about um, our, you know, in our family office, we have a, what we call a growth equity business. We're invested in such diverse businesses um, and uh, no one on the team 
is an industry expert in any of the businesses that we've ever invested in. And we don't expect that because you have certain rules by which you, I guess, by which businesses operate. You just know those fundamental rules. And it's, and it's interesting because, um, you know, in this very challenging time, we've sort of had to move all those businesses from a growth strategy, because we were all working on, well, what are the growth paths for these businesses, to how do we protect ourselves and preserve cash type, um, you know, strategy, which is the total opposite. And um, we've found that because we've got great partners, great uh, entrepreneurs that we're involved with, that they have been able to make those, those moves brilliantly. Fantastic. Now, thank you, Carol. And we're getting a, a number of questions coming through that flowed on from that. And uh, one of the ones that uh, Lana's put up, and there's a couple that are similar. So there aren't as many pitch events now. So how do you meet these brilliant entrepreneurs? Kylie, where are you going in this current environment to find um, potential investments? It's, it's a good question. I mean, I, I'm lucky in that we have a lot of inbound with Eleanor. Um, so we, we don't actually do that much um kind of outreach at the actual pitch events anymore um, we are involved with the accelerators and we'll we'll reach out and 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 um, make sure we know who's in which program um but i i think that my best source of deal flow is my mentor networks so relationships that i have with other mentors other angels we all speak you know we don't all speak every day but i would speak to I don't know, in any week, I'm probably speaking to a dozen other angels who've all got deals that they've been cooking, you know, through their networks. So it's just lots and lots of conversations rather than single events. I actually find those pitch events to be really overwhelming. Um, you know, like the, the noise, you know, the fireworks, heaven forbid, I like to remember there were fireworks, literally seeing your money go up in smoke. Uh, you know, like I, I much prefer to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. And if you can get that introduction from someone who you know and trust, then it's a much easier place to start. Um, also, I don't know how many of you have been to like the online um, pitch events that they're trying to do. Like it's such a hard gig, right? Like I really feel for, for the community and events people that are having to try and put those together because it's, um, you know, um, we, we were discussing before, like online, online content is really tough to make engaging. Um, and when you're, you know, first time founder trying to pitch, oh, I just feel so sorry for them. <laughs> And uh, of course, Angel Network's a great place to look for those uh, mentorships. We've had a question from Ben about who the Angel Networks are in Victoria. Um, at the moment, there are um, a few angel groups. Um, Scale is obviously one of the, the um, originals along with Melbourne Angels. Uh, with the support of Launch Vic, uh, we've helped set up the Impact Angel Group, um, who are focused on impact investing. Um, we're also aware of a couple of others. Um, there's some in the healthcare sector that focus on healthcare and people may be aware and chomping at the bit to understand what Launch Vic is doing in this area. We've actually had a funding uh, round advertised before the pandemic for Angel Networks and we hope we'll be making an announcement very, very soon because um, we know that the number of Angel Networks in, uh, in, in Victoria is approximately four. If we compare ourselves to other ecosystems of the same size like Barcelona or Berlin, they have in, in the order of about 20 Angel Networks, typically um, people that are specialising across particular verticals or horizontals and it's a great way to build networks. Carol, you've got a, a yeah, um, we keep talking about impact investing. How are you defining impact investing, Kate? A oh, great question. And I'm actually going to uh, probably seek Chris's advice here. But uh, um, I think it's fair to say that there's broad definitions of what impact investing is. And uh, the one that we probably see most commonly come across our desk is, that is an investment that is for profit. It's making, making money, but it has strong social, societal uh, uh, environmental payoffs. So um, I, I, I've noted there's been some comments on recycling in the, you know, recycling opportunities, aged care, healthcare, all those things. But Chris may have a, a more precise definition. Um, Chris, over to you. Um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it, the first thing is it, it's a social impact rather than a um, purely financial one. So, <clears throat> so but then the definition comes, what are the areas of social impact do you, are you interested in 
um, yourself. Mm. So it may be you have got to focus on environment. You may have an impact on um, healthcare outcomes. It may be around people and communities. So those are the, the, the social um, impacts. And, and is there, you know, one of the questions that often comes is, do you have to trade off that value mm. between the social impact and um, also the, the, the financial or the economic? And, my, my answer is no. I think that purpose-driven businesses outperform. And um, you know, when when we had our business within um, aged care, we didn't we didn't do the caring, but what we did, we enabled the people at the front line of doing care with, for the elderly um, to um, the impact that they could have delivering that care. And I know that our staff were more committed. We had less staff turnover. We grew, but we were able to engage far better with our the culture within our organisation. And that went seamlessly out to our stakeholders, our customers. And, and we're able to grow as a business because of, because of the people in the, that we were able to achieve and that, that connection we're able to make. So I, if I, if I um, look at any organisation, I, I want to know that around their purpose and I certainly want to know uh, what their social impact is because they will engage their staff members, they will... Get, they will attract people who are committed and they will also be able to attract customers because they're connected at that, at that social impact. Mm. Can, I, can I? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Kylie. I was just going to jump in with, with, with a, a sl slightly different, different view and a, and a funny story. Um, I was lucky enough to speak at the Impact Investment Summit last year. Um, and terrifyingly, I had this slot right after Julie Bishop. Um, and if you've ever heard Julie speak, you will know just how terrifying that actually is. Um, and my, my ticket was that all early stage investing is impact investing because all, um, all entrepreneurs are trying to solve a problem. It's just a matter of how big a problem that you know that that is and 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 the scale of the impact um so i was actually that the story that i told was the story of Spanx. you know the the you know I'm sure there's lots of women on the call we all know what spanks are and it was it was a bit of a you know kind of cute funny you know speech that did not stack up well after Julie's, you know, like 45 minute oration on foreign policy. And I'm arguing that spanks have impact. So I think <laughs> there's, there's room for us all to define impact however we want. And I, I do think that, you know, there, there are many ways to measure impact. You have to figure out what, what's your definition. Yeah. Yeah. And this segues nicely into a question that Kate Morris, one of our great founders in the Victorian ecosystem is asked, which is about valuation. And of course, impact relates to valuation. Um, and Chris, when you're making decisions, you're clearly thinking about tr the you know, impact being a core driver of, of value. Um, but I'm interested in exploring that for, for, for Carol. How do you go about um, thinking about valuations for early stage companies? Well, Valuation is always a negotiation, isn't it? Um, because I might have a completely different view of the value of a business than what the founder entrepreneur has. So um, I think that, um, you know, look, it's, it's, I don't think that there are, there are rules around valuation. I mean, you, obviously you need to look, look at the market, the addressable market. You need to look at what the... Um, what the capacity is of the of the entrepreneur to to grow the business. Um, so I, I, look, I don't think that there's a rule of thumb around around valuation. I think that um, you know it, at the end of the day, it's going to be a negotiation, as it always is. Mm, absolutely. So I'd like to um, change. To Sorry, I'd be I'd be interested in in Chris and Carly's views on valuation. Do you mind? No, not at all. Kylie, Chris, over to you. Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely an art, not a science at early stage valuation. I think it's, it's one of the hardest things, particularly for those of us that come from, uh, you know, from a financial service background or, or are used to using, you know, more traditional big end of town um, valuation methods to kind of, you know, get your head around startup valuation as this, you know, what, what is it? How do you value a business that has, you know, negligible revenue? Um, and and you, you, you almost have to learn a new approach because what, what you thought you knew from, you know, corporate Australia doesn't apply in startups. 
I think the, the fundamental thing as angel investors is to make sure that the cap table doesn't become unbalanced too early. VCs refer to these as structural issues later on down the road. Basically what it means is when the, the founder has given up too much equity. So they're no longer incentivized to work as hard as an early stage founder needs to. And if the valuation is too low, then the founder is going to suffer more dilution. It's going to make it really hard for them to raise in the future. And, and no one wins in that situation. As, as the first investor, you want to make sure you've got that founder like in harness and working for you for, for as long as it needs with plenty of room to bring on new investors. Um, so that's, that's what I always look for first. Mm. And Chris, um, do you have yeah, I think I think Carol and, and Kylie have, have nailed it. In so far as be, being an early stage investor, you're dealing with uncertainty, and that uncertainty is is the interesting part of what you're what you're doing, and 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 it's the exciting part, and therefore the valuation just plays into part of is part of that uncertainty. How you know both both Kylie and Carol have identified that. I, you know, when, when I do look at it, what do I, I, because there is uncertainty, not everything is going to succeed is you've got to be going into the, into it, but you have to believe that they're going to succeed. You have mm. to believe that when I, if it, if it is pre-seed, it's a multiple of that. If it's that, that you need to believe that that company can get to, or if you're at the C level or you're a series A or series B, it's a different multiple. But, but sort of at the seed level, how can I believe this, this company will get a valuation of 10 plus times the money that I put in as a minimum and maybe 15 or 20, but depending on the risk. But that's, that's the point where you say, well, they might be putting a $5 million valuation on this. Can it really become a business that's worth $50 million? Or if they're putting a $20 million, can this become a $200 million business? And if you can't believe that, the, you know, I think Carol was talking about the addressable market. If you can't believe the economics stack up for this business to grow and be able to become a $200 million business, then if they're trying to put, then, then the valuation starts to come back. I can believe you can become 20 million. So I could, I could see this as a $2 million business. That's the sort of thing that I, I would look at is to say, what can I believe um, going into this? So unsurprisingly, in the environment that we find ourselves where we're not sitting in the good shed on a panel and we're sitting at home and uh, it, there's a number of questions coming through on COVID and, and what, what does COVID mean to impact investing? Um, maybe if we could just be specific, you know, has, has COVID changed anything about your investment thesis and the way you go about approaching and evaluating companies? Carol, I might throw to you first. Um. Look, I don't think that it, it, it changes the fundamental questions that, that I would ask when looking at an opportunity. But how it certainly has impacted is, as, as I said before, is that, um, you know, in investors, I mean, people generally are looking to preserve cash and really wait for good opportunities. Now, I don't know that, um, I don't know that enough time has passed in this COVID environment for, you know, exceptional opportunities to have come to the fore yet. Um, but you'll find that investors, and I mean, talking to, I guess, more traditional investors, they're definitely looking for um, opportunities that perhaps six months ago they would not have been looking for. And I think that that's, that's the nature of a crisis, is that there are always going to be winners and losers out of a crisis. And... Um, you know, and what a winner might look like is an entrepreneur who had a great idea six months ago, um, potentially had uh, been too bullish about the valuation of their business. Now, through this crisis, has become a little bit more um, realistic and um, goes back to the network of angel investors and says, well, look, I've thought about it now in the context of where we are. And um, I brought the valuation down. Can we talk talk about investment? So I think that you know, look, it's gonna it's gonna go one of two ways. People are either going to say there are great opportunities coming out of this, and I'm I'm all for it. I'm putting myself out there, or they're going to be saying, look, I think the opportunities are going to come later, and uh, I'm going to sit back for a while and see what happens. Mm. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I think there's some industries that we, we're already seeing a transformation. I know personally, uh, my mother has become a Zoom pro. Um, and uh, Chris, I, I assume that is going to change the aged care sector faster than it might have done without this crisis. And does that then mean that in sectors like healthcare, aged care, there's more opportunity as an investor as a result of this crisis? Yeah, I think, you know, I think, you know, some, yes, um, is, is the short answer, but the, the, probably the more interesting answer is these businesses have been working on, whether it's Zoom or Slack for a longer period of time before that. And it's the same within aged care. We ask, you know, the, the businesses I'm involved with in the aged care industry, around technology have seen an acceleration of their business. Now they were working towards that plan, it's just, just gone quicker. So they're facing different challenges at the moment. They're facing more working capital. How, you know, we, we, we've got to now meet uh, an uptick in demand for the technology because remote monitoring suddenly becomes more important, which has been talked about for a while. Getting more, you know, the, the providers, for example, are looking for more efficiency and better care. And, and the technology was certainly moving down that path but COVID-19 has driven that quicker. So again, they're just a different problem. And, and, and I think that, you know, with the question about does, does this change the way you think about, um, it's not about jumping into aged care or jumping into Zoom because one of the things that um, I would reiterate to anybody going into uh, angel investing is uncertainty. And it, it seemed to me that pre-COVID, you, you had conversations with entrepreneurs who were pitching for money and there was a lot of certainty around what they were doing. But life is uncertain and, and early stage investing is even more uncertain. And if you're an investor, you have to be very comfortable, early stage investor, you have to be very comfortable with uncertainty because the mm. perception beforehand was that maybe things were more certain. And, and now there's just that, uh, I guess, even, you know, different uncertainty. But I, but I would also add one other thing that it doesn't mean that the next virus isn't technology led virus that, you know, we're seeing a lot of, uh, um, you know, cyber crime and cyber hacking what's to what's what's to say the next virus isn't technology that shuts down the internet that shuts down some of the technology and suddenly the human-based businesses look attractive again and it shuts it down that's the sort of uncertainty you have to be thinking about going into it so the question of should you just be investing in technology businesses and in these certain industries again it's the uncertainty of what what continues to happen we wouldn't have predicted COVID, you know three months ago What's to, what's to say that um, the, cha the challenges with the technology virus aren't there as well? Mm. Great, great point, Chris. Really, really great point. And leading on from that, you know, certainly at Launch Vic, we have been inundated with all sorts of entrepreneurs with great responses to COVID. Um, Kylie, what would you suggest to uh, <laughs> what would you suggest to um, these entrepreneurs that are perhaps pivoting really quickly? Sorry, what would you say to investors who are being inundated by entrepreneurs that are pivoting really quickly and they're sort of right, right, right in the spur of the moment? Is this an opportunity for investors, or is this something that investors probably need to be a bit more cautious about and be thinking? You know, work with the, the founders that have the passion, have been in the industry, understand where they're where they're going. What what are you seeing in, in how that's playing out? Yeah, I, I I don't think I don't think there's going to be any overnight success that you have to put your money in right now. Or it's you know it wasn't here yesterday, but it's here today and give us your money in the next two days. That 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 type of you know deal heat isn't isn't going to come about right now in this crisis, I, I don't think, not, 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 for, not for brand new companies. Um, I, I, think, I, think that, I think this is a great time to be investing in early stage deals because these are long-term investments. So the, the questions around trying to time the market aren't as relevant because you are investing for a seven to 10 year horizon. So, you know, the, the investments need to look good now and in whatever future 10 years, 10 years brings. So we've, we've been applying three additional screens um, post COVID. So the, the first is, can they acquire customers in the current environment? Um, and that, that's about making sure that they, they can still grow um, because we don't want to be funding people to go through a hibernation period. Hibernating a business is fine, but I'd rather you not do it with my money. 
Um, the second one is around runway and making sure they have at least two years of runway. Um, and that two year mark is, is probably the minimum because the, the VCs, um, there's been a lot of talk about how the, the amount of money that's deployed by venture capital funds is likely to, to bottom out at the, the 12 to 24 month mark. So we, we, what you don't want to do as an angel investor is invest now and have the company need venture money in 12 months time and for that not to be there. So you want to make sure they've got enough to get past that hurdle. Um, and then the last screen we're applying is, are, are they still as relevant in a, in a post COVID-19 world? Um, and that's the fun one because who the hell knows, right? Like we just <laughs> <laughs> but it's fun to turn your mind to. Yeah, some, some great advice. And um, so I want to tap into, um, so, so there's a question for Usman about your, your top learnings as an angel investor. And I had a similar question. What would you have liked to know now that you didn't know then? Carol, I might throw to you first. Um, do you know what? I always say that I learn my best lessons and the mistakes and failures that I've had. So um, I don't know whether I'd want to bypass any of those um, because those are the things that have created the foundation of my experience going forward. And I think we all have to go through that at, at different stages and at, at our own pace, you know, and I think those learnings are really, really important. So I guess there's lots that I wish I knew, but at the same time, if I knew it, would I, would I make different mistakes? Would I have the same sort of, um, would I have the same sort of instinct that I have now for, for making investments? You know, so I guess, you know, I'm pretty happy that I've made the mistakes and had the failures that I've had because they really add to your skill base. And I, but I do think that, you know, working with someone like Kylie at Eleanor or working with Scale, you can certainly learn, because I did most of my investing on my own um, in the very early stages, I think that if I would have had more of an ecosystem and more of a support group, something like Eleanor, something like Scale, I think that I probably could have bypassed a lot of the mistakes that I, that I did make and, um, and also learned a lot more, a lot, a lot more quickly. Mm. Absolutely. Chris, what about you? Yeah, relationships are important. That 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 you know comes through from from both Carol and Kylie, and I, I, can't, I can't agree more. The relationships you have with other investors to ask ideas because you've got different skill sets. So being able to stress test um, your ideas where you don't see a blind spot, but somebody else can see that that's a great conversation that you can have. And also relationships with the founders, and and um, again, it it takes an incredible skill set to be able to see a problem, grow a business and scale a business. Mm -hmm. and, and not many entrepreneurs can go through all of those three phases. They may be able to get, um, see the problem and start to get the early stage growth where, where you would be investing. But are they the people that can grow a business and then scale a business? And not many businesses truly scale where, where you're talking about, you know, not just growth like expenses and we're growing nicely, we're, but truly that exponential growth and it takes an incredible skill set to do that. So the relationships with other investors, but the relationship and how you think about the leadership team and is, is that team and is that CEO, is that founder going to get you stuck in the growth stage or are they truly going to be able to take this to the valuation that you believe that it can, can achieve? So again, I, I, that, that's probably one of my biggest learnings is where businesses get stuck in the sort of growth stage is more and more based around um, the leaders of the organisation than, than the actual product or the problem they're trying to solve. Absolutely. All great advice. And Kylie, what about you? I'm going to set, throw the same question to you because I think there's a lot we can learn from, from, uh, from, from people's own learnings. Sure. Um, uh, as, as I, I, I really... Uh, echo what, what, what both Chris and Carol have said that, that they've made great points but um, perhaps a, one that's a little more unexpected is you need to get really good at how to say no um, it's it's not something people tells you tell you about angel investing but you have to say no all the time you know you, you say no you know nine times every, you know, for every 10 minutes 
you know, it's probably more like 98 times to every hundred. Um, so read everything you can about how to say no um, quickly and, and respectfully. I think, I think Holly, Richard Branson has a wonderful saying that um, talks to what you just said. And he said, business opportunities are like the bus. There's always another one along. So being able to say no, that's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that founders, you know, often if they don't get a no, they keep, they, they end up spending huge amounts of time raising capital and they think they've got a positive line and you're actually doing that founder a disservice by not telling them a no because you're, you're not telling them fast enough. So they have hope. And while they have hope, they're going to keep raising. And we know that, you know, the US, the average angel round will take four to six weeks. In Australia, it actually takes longer to raise angel than it does to raise from venture capital at Series A. So it's typically on average around six months to raise an, a, an angel round. And it's not uncommon to hear from founders that have been trying for a year and they think they've got great investors. And I think there's something very Australian about not wanting to say no. So I think there's a, a learning for, for everyone in that and, and founders to be really asking investors that they meet, is this a yes or a no, and sort of demanding an answer. And at the same time, founders doing those, uh, investors doing those founders a service by saying no as, as, as quickly as they, uh, as, as quickly as they can. So uh, yeah, it's a challenge. So I'm very conscious of time. I've only got a few more minutes. I wanted to um, just throw out a, an ending question to you all. And, and what do you think we're going to, the world's going to look like? And indeed, Angel and, and the startup ecosystem more precisely in five years time after this. Are we better off for this crisis that we find ourselves in? Um, before leading into this, we were in a growth stage. We had these wonderful organizations like Scale and Impact Investment Group and Eleanor Ventures really driving our ecosystem. Are we going to be looking at a more positive startup ecosystem as a result of this, better businesses, or are we going to be looking at something that's a bit more challenging and perhaps uh, a little bit more of a worrying world? Carol, I might throw to you first. Okay, well, you know, the phrase never waste a good crisis has been bandied around a lot. And um, I, am, I am a complete optimist. Um, and I can see lots of opportunities coming out of this crisis, not only in terms of um, existing businesses, but also new businesses and new ways of doing things. I mean, we're all talking about Zoom, we're talking about telemedicine and telehealth, you know, when you, and, and even the development of the COVID app, how quickly that happened, the, the regulations around it. I mean, I think that these sorts of things inspire huge innovation. And uh, I think that Australians will really come to the fore on that. So I'm actually incredibly optimistic and positive. And I suspect that goes to your fundamental risk appetite as well, which is <laughs> the discussion, which, uh, which says a lot and, and probably, uh, you know, is something that a lot of aspiring angels can, can learn a huge amount from. Uh, Kylie, how about you? Yeah, I, I, I am... <sighs> I agree with with what Carol said. I, I'm I'm generally optimistic, and I, I think there will be some some great success stories, um, and and we will continue growing. However, what we don't know yet is the role of superannuation. Um, so superannuation has only just recently started deploying capital into venture funds, um, and there has been a lot of flack levied at superannuation funds recently because of the, the early release provisions. I mean, should, should they have more liquid funds? I don't think that more pressure will be put on them, but what do I know? You know, it's not my area. I'm just like talking off the cuff here. I forgot it was a call. Um, but if, if superannuation was to retreat from investing in venture capital funds, the size of our venture funds will decrease, which will have a negative effect on the whole ecosystem. Um, so there are some venture funds that are publicly still fundraising now. If, you know, once we get the signal that super is, is still in, I think I'm going to be super bullish. Um, until then, I'm, I'm quietly optimistic. Very good and a, a great insights there. And I think uh, we certainly... Um, know that some of the super funds have, uh, well, they all have requirements on how much private equity firms they hold. And of course, the fall in the liquidity markets um, also causes a, a retreat from the market because they're overexposed to private equity at this point in time. So there are some real challenges on the super, super fund size. So I think that's a, a very, very pertinent point and a great point well made. 
Chris, over to you. Oh, uh, well, I think, you know, um, if, if we ever need a reminder of the lucky country that we live in, what is going on at the moment is, is, um, is, is that reminder very starkly. I mean, you know, acknowledging the human suffering going on around the world and um, um, we've largely been, largely missed that and that, that human suffering will go on for a long period of time, particularly um, the poorer countries, because um, as always, the, you know, what, what is happening with some of the sort of Latin American, South American countries and the Asian countries will be very, you know, will be a long period of human suffering. So just acknowledging how lucky we are in this country and um, the, what we can look forward to, I think, is rather than um, this, uh, this sort of mentality of we've got to be the next unicorn growth at all stages, that, that growth will come back and we'll start to look at businesses that what, again, um, more about the margins and the, 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 the sustainability of those businesses in a, in a social way, but also in, in that profitability way, the, the growth at all costs mentality that seemed to be creeping into the way we looked at businesses. Um, so that would be the bless in the mess for me will be, I think the change in thinking about business, the change business can drive. Um, and uh, certainly in the next five years, um, again, very fortunate to live in this country. Yeah, again, very well made points, Chris, and uh, couldn't agree with you more. And uh, I know we've got two minutes to go, so um, my job is to, to wrap up. And I think um, I personally have found this one of the most interesting conversations I've had in this shutdown period and uh, certainly raised some really um, insightful um, thoughts. Carol, I think you leave us with your, your risk appetite and your abundance of optimism and learnings. And I think uh, one of the things that we don't hear enough is that we do all need to learn and make mistakes. And I think while we're here at Launch Vicar trying to wrap the right supports around the system, actually, you just need to jump off the end of that diving board and learn on your own and yes, make use of supports. But I think that it's certainly something that will um, you've left with me today is, uh, is a reminder that we need to be brave and we need to take that risk. So thank you. And uh, from Chris, I think, you know, you've made a lot of, again, pertinent comments, and I think you've really focused on the relational side of, in of investing. And I think, again, that importance of understanding your relationships and, and your own blind spots to reach out to others and your mentors is really important. But also that relationship with the founder is absolutely critical. And at the end of the day, you're, you're backing a founder, not a business. And uh, as much as you're there to make money, um, you have really got to make sure you know the personalities behind that to help you be successful and Kylie I think you've made an enormous number of, of contributions today and I think your points about super funds are incredibly well made your points about syndication are incredibly well made and you know it, it, all these programs like Eleanor Ventures and Scale and IIG and um and other groups are, are there to support angels and I know we've got a large number of people that are learning on the journey today and I can't encourage you enough to reach out to these wonderful leaders that are in our ecosystem because they're providing the supports to help people on this journey as they explore. So thank you so much to Carol, Chris and Kylie for a really fabulous discussion and thank you also as always to the attendees and my team for pulling this together. We couldn't do it without you. So we hope you all have a really wonderful day and, and many, many thanks again, especially to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, thank Kate. you, Kate. Thank you. Take care, everyone, and have a really good day. Bye. Bye.